Okay, there's a couple minutes left, but I think I'm going to get started. So, well, first of all, I want to thank uh, Software Crafters for the organization and, of course, our amazing speakers because, okay, it takes a lot of work to get this thing done. So, thank you very much to all of them. You can applaud them. It's free. Okay, thank you. <laughs> okay, so let's get started. Or not. Yeah. So this is Joy. Joy has been one of my role models for a few months now. Um, basically because uh, she runs an organization called the Algorithmic Justice League, which I kind of love. I just <laughs> wish I came up with that name myself. But the thing is, back when this picture was taken, Joy was working, uh, well, was uh, studying at MIT, and she works with facial recognition software. She, uh, her work is about how to interact with robots. And she was facing quite a problem, and the problem she was facing was she's black. Well, apparently, crazy as it thinks, the robot she was working with uh, was completely incapable of recognizing her face as a face at all. So the mask she is wearing in this picture is actually the mask she needs to use in order to get the robot to recognize her face and to, to be able to actually present her work and be able to code her work. Because the libraries she, uh, the robots were using are completely incapable of recognizing a black face. So the thing is, uh, would you say those libraries were faulty? Would you say there's something wrong with them? You can answer, you can raise your hand. Okay? Yeah? Okay, it's not a trick question, not this one. Um, okay, so this is for Joy. Have you ever heard about the Volkswagen Dieselgate scandal? Yeah, anyone who doesn't know it? Good. <laughs> so, just to be sure, the problem with the Dieselgate scandal is um, there was some software installed on the, on the cars that would detect when the car was being tested so that they could uh, lower the emissions that the, the engines were provoking and in, in so doing be able to uh, make it look like they were fulfilling the Clean Act air in the United States. So uh, up until the time when a group of students in West Virginia University found it, basically by accident, that, that software was running on the Volkswagen cars for over seven years, and it ran smoothly. It, was, it wasn't bugged. It was obviously not bugged. Would you say that software was faulty? Okay, this is a trick question. It's not that hard. Okay. <laughs> so, you know the quote, right? With great power. Nowadays, software is everywhere. It's the robots Joe is working with, it's the cars we're driving, it's our bank accounts, our laptops, smartphones. Even the medical equipment that we need to interact with when, when you are going through a physician checkup. It's everywhere. And I'm not sure we pay that much attention to it. And the thing is, we're here, and most of us, we are developers. And we've heard a lot about software principles. And the thing is, that, that got me thinking, because we keep talking about these software principles. And I actually, I, I tried Googling it. It's, it, it's funny, because, uh, I tried Googling it on a private tab so that Google doesn't have the information on, on, on previous uh, searches that I made. And the first result I got, awkwardly enough, was from Amazon. By some principles on Amazon. That, that, I wasn't expecting that one. Uh, <laughs> after that, you get the, the usual solid principles. Don't repeat yourself. Keep it simple. Yeah, on and on and on with all of them. Um, 
Um, well, what I saw was that these principles are all about how we developers interact with our code. It's always about us. It's always about how we have to work with this code. But we are also users. And who among you can honestly tell me that trust their users? Yeah, no hands, no hands here. <laughs> The problem is we are users too, and as users we don't have a choice. If you want to make any kind of transaction on your bank account, do you have a choice? Can you choose whether to actually trust the developer behind that software or not? If you go to a hospital, can you choose? If you get onto your car, can you choose? No, you can't. So I wanted to kind of introduce a twist here and think about what would be some principles to be able to define good quality software from the point of view of a user? This is what I came up with. First of all, we need to think about software that fulfills some standard behavior, meaning if I'm going to interact with this software, whatever this is, in a way, I want it to be the same way tomorrow. I don't want it to be randomly generating different outputs every time I have to interact with it. I want it to be manageable. Have you ever tried to do your taxes? That's hell. <laughs> so I want to actually be able to understand how do I have to interact with this thing. It has to be available. And I'm not just talking about server availability, like, yeah, sure, your service has to be up. But I'm talking about Joy here, because she had that robot in front of her, but the software wasn't available for her. She couldn't get the service she needed from that software. Of course, it has to be reliable, okay? If you buy on Amazon, you expect the transaction to go through and actually only get into your bank account once and get your product. That'd be nice. And it has to be truthful. That meaning uh, we need our cars not to be deceiving, deceiving us, our Facebook accounts not to be selling our data. That'd be nice. So this is my addition to the solid and dry and keys principles. When you go coding, just think about it twice. Don't just go solid, go smart too. Because we are also users. So back in our developers' shoes, there are a few things that we tend to agree on uh, that our code should be respecting. So first of all, any code base is pretty much like a library in the fact that it is composed by the work of many different peoples in many different moments of time. So when you think about being able to interact with this software, First thing you need is for it to have some kind of organization, some kind of pattern. You need to be able to actually go and find the piece of that software you need to work with. And even if you are able to see these patterns, if the developer before, before us respected some kind of uh, structure, you need the, the code to be readable too. And for the code to be readable, you also need uh, you also need good naming, okay? This is one of the hardest parts I've ever dealt with when interacting with other developers within a team. Naming is hell. Names should be precise, names should be ubiquitous, and names should be unambiguous. And these are all characteristics that your code has to fulfill in order to be able to be, to be read. But this another dimension to code that I don't listen to people talking about quite so often. And that's the idea of the credibility of our code, okay? We talk about how our code should be readable, and that's great, our code should be readable. We should be able to actually go into a class, read it through, and understand what it does. But that's just understanding what the code is telling us it does. But we don't know for sure. I mean, if we knew, there wouldn't be any bugs. So we need to make our classes believable, too. And how could we ever do that? 
<laughs> so testing. <laughs> I'm going to tell you now something you've obviously never heard, not in this conference ever, ever before. You should be doing TDD. <laughs> OK. My journey into TDD wasn't an easy one. It was more or less like this. <laughs> my <laughs> I have already finished my development process. Why, why do I even have to add, add tests to it, this thing? I mean, you can say it, it works. Why do I have to test this shit? <laughs> okay, it was like, okay, I have to test it because my pull request is not going through otherwise. Oh my goodness, this is hard because obviously the code you have written is not written with your tests in mind. Do we really need to test all of our code? Really, really, really? All of it? And there was, there was a point where I actually begin to understand this idea of testing, it was like, OK, there might be something here. I think I'm beginning to understand. <laughs> so at some point in time, uh, well, basically when someone actually explained TDD to me, and I understood that it wasn't about doing all of your tests first, I came to understand what TDD was offering me. Then again. How is it that these tests help us? Before getting into it, let's make one thing perfectly clear. Your tests have to fulfill all the same rules of your, as your code. Your tests have to be readable. OK, who here hasn't found a class marvelously written and a bunch of tests absolutely messed up that you cannot understand? <laughs> Your tests have to follow some kind of pattern. But once you get there, there's another dimension to your tests. And that is, your tests have to be meaningful. They have to have some kind of meaning behind them. It's not just about putting a bunch of tests there. So these are a few examples from our production environment. Okay. So these ones I didn't make up. These are real. <laughs> Public function test update when client doesn't exist. OK, if anybody here can actually explain to me how could you update a client that doesn't exist, please come forward. I'm still struggling with it. Um, more on the same line, sync client not exists username. Isn't that nice? OK, I don't know if you can read this one. This one bothers me for a very specific reason. I'm not against copy-pasting. That's OK if you are going to actually test a full functionality on, on a very specific topic. But could you please not write it up like checkmate doesn't exit every time? <laughs> then again, there's this. Public function registration? Who don't know? And my absolute favorite of all time. <laughs> we actually managed to have two of these, not just one, test given when then. So yeah, using patterns is great, but please keep in mind that patterns are just patterns. You're supposed to actually make it fit your needs. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, right when I was thinking that I was starting to understand TDD, I, I got faced to that. So there's better ways to do tests, and you can have something better written, or at least most readable. Create user with correct data. Does any have a pro anyone have a problem with this? I don't know what what behavior are you testing? What do you expect? Yeah, what do you expect from this? What is correct data? What 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 is creating a user supposed to do? What are we going to be testing here? So yeah, that's right. I mean, it's not exactly wrong. It's not like we are updating a user that doesn't exist, but still, it's not telling us anything. 
And this is to prove that you can actually put a very long name and still be on the same case. Calculate profile with correct param should return a valid response. <laughs> okay. It should. I, I, I agree, it should. So the connection between all of these examples is when you write your tests, there's a need for a narrative to them. Your tests should not tell you what the code is doing. They should tell you what the code should be doing. And in so doing, your tests are the single most powerful tool we have to actually add credibility to our codes. Because in reading the tests, we should be able to understand what our code should be doing without actually having to navigate the code, without actually having to navigate the, co the test code we should be able to understand our code bases based solely on reading the names of our tests. And of course, there are different layers of testing. So yeah, the narrative to our unit tests are not this very much similar to the narratives of uh, our integration tests or our acceptance tests. To be honest, even our product owners should be able to read our acceptance test, but they probably shouldn't be able to read our unit tests. But we need to start thinking about those characters behind the scenes that we are supposed to be testing here. And if we talk about acceptance or even integration tests, we even should be thinking about those characters being part of, a, of our domain model. We should be able to put our domain model not just on our code, but also on our tests. then this is a test that I personally agree with. Invoice number should be reset when changing year. Do we understand what this test is about? Do we need to actually read the code behind the test? But here we know what's going on. So the thing is, going back to the library picture, we are just another one of those people putting our work into a code base. We are another author yet adding another book to this library. Someone else or even us will have to go back to this code some, at some point. And the thing is, we, we have a responsibility here. We, we really need to think what we are putting there. Because if we are capable of writing really good tests that describe and add credibility to our code, we really are capable of understanding what is it that our code is doing. So oftentimes I find developers that just want the formal description of the task at hand written on their JIRA card in order to get going with whatever they have been tasked to do. And whenever I talk about the Dieselgate scandal, the answer I most often get is maybe they didn't know. Really, maybe. So if they didn't know, they should have been doing way better tests way better. And if you understand your model, you should be very much aware of what your code is doing. And you have a responsibility both to ourselves and to future developers to understand what we are putting on our code. Because imagine that point where you get working into Volkswagen and you get faced with code that clearly is doing something illegal. What are your options then? But then again, tell me that nobody wrote a test to actually understand that the code, that the car was understanding whether it was undergoing a test or not. So yeah, let's think about this code base as something that will keep growing and we will keep adding to it. And we will change code bases, but we won't change the spot. We will always be that other developer that gets there, gets a little piece of the work done, and then jumps into another project.
So that's it from me. <laughs> I think it's quite intense <laughs> in, <laughs> in the way that um, maybe we don't think about this a lot. And I, I want to use this space for questions and let's hear what your reflections may be on, on this topic. Because I, I know that yesterday we had an open space about ethics in, in development. I don't know if anyone in the room was there yesterday, but I know that this is a topic that it's kind of arising here. So feel free to, to ask or, or share with us any, any thoughts or ideas. Hi, thank you. The talk was amazing and the idea is amazing and I missed you yesterday in the open space debate because some of these ideas came up and you clearly have a vision. I think this is Stacco Plan or Nick. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, so when you talk about smart and being truthful, you're saying, okay, I work in a project that is not evil, but I want not to be, uh, if I understood it, it correctly, I don't want to deceive users. So I want, uh, I work in an engine of a car and I want to put stuff there that is not supposed to do what an engine should be doing. But what about the, the wider topic? Like, what about if m the nature of my project is evil? Like, what if, uh, what if, I, mm, uh, if I'm designing the, I don't know, the software for a, for a bomb to point to a, to a person and kill it? Or, or even in a gray area where I'm uh, working in a, uh, in a um, gambling software or in, in the adult industry, which you know what it means. Uh, so, in this in this areas, thank you for the trust, there. <laughs> I mean, because I cannot say porn, right? Here. <laughs> okay. I believe we can. Okay. So, uh, what are the? Yeah. Uh, this is not maybe the the software is not mm, deceiving anyone. It's truthful, but the purpose is is evil. What what do we do here, in this case? What are the directives? You know, there's like two millennia of philosophy on that topic. They didn't know software, but they knew right and wrong. Um, for what I have been told, there were there was uh, this discussion about ethics yesterday. It's not quite what I'm talking about here, but I find it really interesting. The thing about ethics is we share a great part of an ethics system as a society because it, it is in a great percentage a result of our social culture and environment. But there is a part that always comes to the individual on deciding not just what to do, but what we consider right or wrong. And afterwards, it's again about the individual, whether we decide to fulfill our ethics code or not. So, in the end, it's a personal decision. And what we, be, we need to be really, really conscious about here is ethics. It's solely a, a way of living your decisions, but you will never face legal consequences based on your ethics system. The way the engineer at Volkswagen got uh, a prison sentence was not about ethics. That was about accountability, which is a legal concept. It is not the same. It can coincide on, on many, many parts, but it's not the same. So in the end, is you, you need to actually reflect on, on these kind of decisions and face whatever your decision are going, is going, are going to, to make, because it's you who is going to have to live with it. And nobody can help you there, can, can help you reflect, but that's it. Hello. Um, so I, d I don't have a question. I just wanted to share a story that happened to me a couple of years ago. I was working on, on an airline. And at some point, someone from marketing came down to IT, and uh, he was very smiling, um, saying, oh, I came up with a, an awesome idea. Um, 
we'll target the, the garbage customers and uh, we'll try to put them, so we need to write an algorithm to put them always in the worst place possible in a plane. Um, and that, 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 that was a big problem. I, I didn't like the idea, but you are in a company, eh? so I ended up escalating to legal and in the end, it was not about the algorithm, it was about the terminology, calling garbage customers and stuff. But it was it was ca quite a fight for us to to refuse to do that, and they could have actually said, "Yeah, you need to do it." And the choice, uh, I was in a bit of a position of power, um, so I was not just a, a software developer. But um, sometimes it's very difficult those things. Yes, I absolutely agree. Um, I've heard this argument before, and the thing is, even though. I would accept it under different circumstances. We are right now developers in Barcelona where there is an amazing shortage of <laughs> developers. And it's, chances are if you refuse to do something and even if you get fired for it, you will probably find another job. And sure, if you are in a position where your safety is at stake, I can understand that this is a bit of a struggle because you have to choose between actually being able to keep on going like you are and then having to leave knowing that you are doing something you are not quite proud of and having to know that you are helping build a future you don't want to be part of. And we are building the future here. I mean, future is going to be software. Future is software today. So we are shaping and modeling not just our classes, we are shaping and modeling the world we interact with. So we need to be thinking carefully about this. I would say I don't buy it for any developer here in Barcelona <laughs> most of the time, but you know, each case has its, its specifics. Hi, uh, thanks for the uh, chat, it was great. I like it a lot. Uh, I I really wanted to comment a case that we uh, in our company we, we had some weeks ago. Uh, there is another company working now with us, like a third party, to measure happiness in the company. So they have this software that uh, you can uh, write comments anonymously, and the the chief of that company came. Uh, give us gave us a chat about that and told us that they don't uh, they took steps to assure anonymity in uh, in so that no one in a, with a bad comment could be traced back uh, but he said that eventually they would uh, uh, if someone really wanted to they could uh, track IPs or sort of so. Is sometimes it's not just that we as developers uh, ensure that our software is uh, ethic, but also the environment should contribute that, uh, or, or maybe we we should take more steps, not just the precise steps, to assure that our software is in this case not traceable to, to the user, I don't know. Yeah. yeah, nobody is expecting us to actually be perfect on the work we do. And all we can ask ourselves to do is reflect on the work we are doing before we jump straight into it and think about what could be the consequences for us as users if we had to interact with this software. Then again, put ourselves in the shoes of those users that we are actually and think about, do we want to interact with this software like it is? Because most of the time we have privileged information. We know that those IPs can be traced back. And that's not common knowledge. That's not something anyone on the supermarket queue could tell you. So it is our responsibility to actually take our time, stop for a minute, and think about what we are doing before jumping on the next JIRA task that is just written on our, on our sprint. I have a first uh, very small question. When you, when you were introducing the SMART acronym, 
with the history about joy, you mentioned uh, A as available, but then your description sounded a little bit like accessible. So yeah. people who don't, f so it, I wanted to, uh, to double check if there is a distinguish, uh, a difference for you and to choose available instead of uh, accessible. Accessible meaning uh, people with visual impairments or uh, motor impairments. I'd go for accessible. It's not that easy to come up with a new acronym, you know? I, I, yeah, yeah. I, I, I understand. Just, just wanted I spent to like a whole afternoon doing that and <laughs> I, I thought it was good enough. Just, just wanted to double check if in your mind there was a, a different Actable, approach. Yeah, it's, it's about accessibility, yes. Cool, cool. Uh, and then I, I have a, a second uh, question for, for your opinion. You, you mentioned just recently how uh, the market in Barcelona makes it very easy to just uh, switch jobs if you don't like the... Or, or you, you Most don't, of the times. Exactly. If, you, if your ethics don't align with the, with the company. I've been on that position and I, uh, I left, but at the same time, I still think that I could have done more to, for example, convince other people who were not doing this self-reflection of maybe these ethics don't uh, align with the world. So I, I maybe could have done better to prevent, like uh, Pedro uh, described, right? So my, my, my concern is, here is, should we just quit? Should we just change things? Should we raise them with the cost of uh, uh, back uh, actions from whoever is in power? I don't have ethics answers for you guys. I, I, <laughs> I, I know, I know, I know, but... but yes, I understand what you, what you mean. And the thing is, if you think you can do something more than you are actually doing and you are willing to do it, then by all means, if you think this is the fight you should be fighting, then by all means, go ahead and do it. But I cannot decide that for anyone. So what we were talking about if was if you are in a position where your only way of staying within a company is actually going through with a piece of software that you sh you know you sh that shouldn't exist and should shouldn't be out there in production if that's the only way then quit if possible but that was that particular example if you think you can negotiate this piece of software to be different to be rethink uh, rethinking about uh, the, this idea if you think you can actually make an impact on your company and change the course of action then by all means go ahead that's that's the best scenario but usually you cannot have this kind of power as a developer but you have the power to not build this thing that shouldn't be built Uh, so congratulations on your talk. And Thank you. Uh, I don't know for sure, but by your shirt, I, I'd i say that you work for an energy company. Is that right? <laughs> okay. <laughs> so energy companies' ethics has been questioned uh, quite a lot lately. And so how does all this uh, ethics stuff uh, fit it with... Uh, with your daily That's a job. good one. <laughs> Thank you. Um, how can I put it? Because we don't know that much about the electricity market usually in, in this country. And the thing is, we've heard a lot about the problematics of this. And there's quite a lot of misinformation. So the thing is, there's a part of the market that is in charge of actually distributing the energy throughout the whole peninsula. And actually, we share that with uh, Portugal. I, I lost Pedro. I think he, he left. And we, we have the same network. And there's a whole part that is in charge of that. So some of those companies actually take part in the other side of the market, which is the market agents that sell this electricity, that go to a pool buy this electricity and sell it. So those companies actually do not decide whether you get 
your installation done, they actually just play around, sort of play around with the money. And the problem was that many, many people was being told that that was exactly the same thing and they couldn't change or they couldn't choose. And this is supposed to be a free market for that part. The part of distributing the energy that's regulated by law, so there's nothing we can do about that. But the part that's about actually buying and selling electricity, that's a free, a free market. So all I can tell you is I work for a company that has no distribution at all. We only commercialize the product. So uh, the, the way we can actually get, get an impact on the system is limited. Even though, and that's, that's just marketing here, <laughs> we are actually trying to promote self-consumption and, and green energies based on solar panels and stuff like that. Hi, thank you for your talk. Hello. Um, I've been wondering lately, the past years, about um, how can we sort of uh, let, let me let me think the whole thing through because it's like a a, a lot of uh, yeah, it's not easy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I was thinking that as both developers and users, we are sort of victims to some sort of platforms and uh, and uh, utilities that we get comfortable using. For instance, there's this uh, cloud-based image uh, sharing. It's not the word, but uh, I'm not getting a little bit nervous. <laughs> so um, there's this um, image uh, cloud in which you can save your photos and albums and stuff. And I've been using that for a few years now. Um, there's pictures of my family, my dogs, and everything. And I've learned a few months ago that this company is using image re uh, recognition and facial recognition to um, help the US military with their drones. And it's quite unclear what they're doing exactly with that. And it's like, oh, so every picture I took is uh, right now being used probably for something not good. So um, I was thinking that we are aware of that because we as developers understand that we can come up with uh, an image recognition software. And without knowing what's the use for that, it's like we are uh, isolated for the purpose of that piece of software. And on the other hand, as users, you are used to using something and uh, you don't get to know what's going on behind the, you know, the, um, the, the, um, the curtains if you say so. So um, I was thinking, how could we come up with a way to inform people, maybe report if we are about to uh, to be in front of uh, some sort of illegal or unethical piece of software? And every time I talked about that, it's like, well, if you don't do it, someone else is going to do it either way. So it's like, I don't think that's a solution, you know? Because it's like. It's also a fallacy. I mean, there's no way of knowing what everyone else is going to be doing if you don't do it, period. So you don't know that for sure. What you know uh, and what you can control is what you do. That's it. And yeah, sure, it, it'd be nice to actually be able to kind of alert users of uh, companies misusing their data or whatever particular situation we may we may encounter. Uh, it's not that easy because many, many way, uh, cases, the, the language we use to describe these situations are completely alien to the end user. So it is about trying to add some semantics and some context to the work we do. It is about trying to reach out and be able to communicate in a way that the one person that is listening to you is capable of, of understanding. And it is about raising awareness because for the end user, it's not that obvious that those files are not 
on their computers. So yeah, it is pretty obvious to us. And oftentimes, we believe that what is obvious to us should be obvious to everyone else, and that is not the case. And last but not least, some users may not want to know. So then again, what you can do is just not build software you don't align with. You can have done it in the past and then regret it. You can think that what you did wasn't right. And it's not about torturing yourself because you did something that you aren't proud of as of now. It's about, hey, I think this is not so OK now. So just from now on, let's try and reflect this for the future. Let's try and make our colleagues in this in industry take a step back, think for a minute, and then go forward. And many, many times, we won't agree with decisions made by other people. But that's the thing. We make different decisions. We have different contexts. And yeah, maybe if you don't do it, someone else will do it. But the most you can expect from someone is to act in a way they themselves think is the right way. And in that doing, the most you can ask someone to do is to actually act in a way that they feel is right. Um, so thank you, that was a really interesting presentation and I think the discussion is really interesting and for me, like I, I agree with what you're saying, like all, all you can do on an individual level is act according to your choices and ask people to act according to theirs. But also like to go back to the example of being in a project team and not wanting to implement a feature, as an individual maybe the only choice you have is to, to leave or implement that feature. But if the whole team decided not to implement that feature, it's a lot harder to fire a whole team, right? Like, companies can't necessarily afford to do that. So I do think, like, there's a lot. As individuals, we can't necessarily do that much. But as a group of people, we can. And there's some examples. There's an example from Google about how Google had to drop its Project Maven contract with the Pentagon because so many of Google's workforce said, this isn't OK, we're not doing this. Like, and so they dropped it, and so they stopped it. So I wonder what you think, like, if all we can do is ask people as individuals to make choices, how can we still organize in groups to have the leverage we need to, to actually change things? Having this kind of conversations, that's it. I mean, from mi the minute the topic arises and the discussion forms, you have a way of knowing whether you are all alone on, on your fight or there's someone else who agrees with you. And whatever the answer to that question is, you can actually get into a loop of feedback. Like, am I the one who's wrong or am I the one who's right? And you can actually reflect on the opinions of the, the other people that actually make your team. And yes, probably even by having this discussion arise, you will get to a point where you can actually get a little bit more of strength and, and yes, convince a group of people that yes, the whole team is against this feature and we are not going through with it. Um, following on that, and I'm going to build on what some people said, Let's fo uh, see that uh, a situation in which we don't have uh, neither the group advantage or this possibility, like the Volkswagen. Imagine that the Volkswagen thing is only, uh, in the end, is only about one or two people. Uh, and uh, my question is super, is super concrete. If you are facing a situation in which you have two options, either be a whistleblower and just say, okay, I'm gonna face legal actions, I'm gonna break my thing, versus just leaving. Uh, how do you deal? Well, uh, again, sorry, ethics questions. I, again, but I'm trying to narrow it down as much as possible. How do you deal with this? Should we promote uh, uh, or defend as a collective this kind of whistleblowing, or should we say no, no, let's focus on on creating this kind of awareness and just go to the next job because in the end no one will feel this. But again, it depends on the context. But there's 
there's one thing I want to make perfectly clear here, and it's this idea of legal consequences, because um, there's a common misconception about responsibility being sometimes ethics, sometimes accountability. And you may face legal consequences for something you consider ethically right. You may not face legal consequences for something you consider ethically wrong. And you can be in between. So then again, it depends a lot in the, qu in, in the context of, of that particular situation, whether you can actually, you think you can actually have a, a huge impact and you go for it, or you think you are just going to end up in jail for the rest of your life with nothing accomplished. So you have to go with what you think might be the right answer in, in that particular moment. I cannot give you a, a clear guide of, listen, I believe we should be constantly whistleblowing this thing. No idea. I have never run a multi-million company. I don't know the kind of pressure you have to be facing there. I, I, I do not know. I, I can suggest maybe you can read some philosophy on that topic. There's a lot. <laughs> but other than that, you have to reflect. You have to evaluate the consequences. You have to evaluate your context. You may want to talk to someone next to you to actually be able to listen to yourself and listen to someone else, get a different perspective, then make a choice. Can I answer that? <laughs> be my guest. Because we've had this talk before, Paula. So. No, you have never had this talk oh. with me before. <laughs> I never talk about this. And the ethics of uh, code is important, but I think this is a bit related also to like the whole if people should stay in a company and diversity and things like that. And it goes with, you cannot choose for other people. Each one has its own ethic and its own morals. What you can do is build a system that everyone around you will always do what's right for them. So for some people, that will be whistleblowers. Like that would be my immediate reaction would be blow the whole shit up on fire. But not everyone has. You don't want to be her. No, no, not everyone has the strength nor the support financially or mentally to do that. So, and not everyone has the same ethics as me. So what I can do, what I can make sure that I do is that everyone that works with me or that works around me, if they feel bad, if they are doing something that is ethically wrong, or that not only that they reflect before they do it, but also that they know that they have to do what's right. And maybe that's right, I don't think it's right for me, like I might disagree with them, but it is what's right for them. You cannot push someone to do something because you think it's right. Everyone has a different set of ethics. It changes a lot depending on the culture, and it changes a lot depending on what, at that point of their life they are. So you cannot really ask the question of, should they be whistleblowers or should they really leave? They should do what they think is right. And you have to enforce the system of people to reflect when they do things and when they code and which teams they're part on, and then force them to always do what's right by them. And that's all you can do. I actually, I, I want to get a little bit deeper into that because we don't think about this very much, but in that way, a legal system is actually some framework we as a society built to try and get those ethics rules that are floating around everywhere and put them into concrete rules that you are supposed to follow. And yes, legal systems change, and yes, sometimes we don't agree with a particular set of rules, but there's this idea behind them that they are trying to build a framework for individuals in a society to actually be forced into acting the right way. Yes. Hi. Well, uh, congr yes. Uh, congratulations for your speech. Um, I would like to ask you um, about the next steps that the European Union is about to, to do over... Oh, if you know about it. I, I think we are getting out of my depth here. <laughs> okay, okay, okay. No, no, you, just, just, uh, just you know if you know something about it. Uh, about the, the, the steps that the European Union is about to, to protect whistleblowers, you know, if, if I don't, I mean, I'm not sure if something is going to change in this way, you know, uh, they, they are, they are going about to, to rule, to, to protect, to, 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 you know, 
to, say, uh, to do some steps to do uh, to improve the protection over over whistleblowers. I'm not sure okay. if, if something is going to change um, in Spain. Luckily, you know. I don't have a fixed answers. I don't have a crystal <laughs> kind of connection to the future either. I have no absolutely no idea. I mean, uh, I've never been into law before or like ever and. To be honest, I don't even know what those steps are. So, but I want to I, I want to reflect on one speci specific thing, and that is you never know what's going to happen, and you can only guess, and you can only hope. So that cannot be an argument into doing nothing because you are not sure that that is going to change anything. I would I would go as far as saying that if you expect that to have a negative outcome, then don't go for it. But if you have no idea if that is going to help or not, but you think it could, then that's your only choice. You should go for it. You your only other choice is just do nothing and stay on the same on spot you were, which you didn't like to begin with. So just go for it. That's it. That's that's all the answers we needed. <laughs>